I'm Dre, the host and founder of the Dragon Network, an online member-based community where health IT professionals can share their ideas, discuss their experiences, and collaborate with one another on all things related to health IT. On this week's video, I wanted to follow up on something that I mentioned in the International Patient Summary video last week related to the codification of medication items. And I want to really focus on what some of the codification systems are, how they're structured conceptually, and where we see some of the complexities. I'm going to use RX Norm and NDC as the examples. These are two codifications that are utilized in the US, but the structure and the concept behind it is something that's repeated in almost all countries in the world. So it's not necessarily just for the US, just keep in mind the concepts do apply to others. Let's start with Rx Norm. Rx Norm is maintained by the National Library of Medicine and it is a tool to assist with the semantic interoperability of drug terminologies. Rx Norm is also a normalized naming system for generic and branded drugs in the United States. It applies to clinical drugs that are both prescription and some over the counters, as well as to drug packs or drugs that need to be administered in a certain specific sequence. So it's important to note that RxNorm does not address non-therapeutic radiopharmaceuticals, bulk powders, contrast media, food, medical devices, or dietary supplements. The main purpose of RxNorm codes is to identify the active ingredients, the strength, and the dose form. So to walk through how they're sort of structured and what it looks like, we're gonna use Benadryl or diphenhydramine hydrochloride as our example. I'm choosing this one because it's something that I think most people will be familiar with and it provides us with a very wide range of examples that we can sort of walk through. So in order to produce an RX Norm code, there's five main steps that occur. So if we're looking at the diphenhydramine hydrochloride example, for oral tablets, you can see that there's several different synonyms or concepts that will come up frequently in those vocabulary lists. So they're all exactly the same thing. They're all looking at the 25 milligram oral tablet, but they're just articulated in a slightly different way. So the first thing they're gonna do is they're gonna group those together. The second thing that they're gonna do is they're gonna create a normalized name. So in this particular instance, the normalized name that was assigned is in fact diphenhydramine hydrochloride 25 milligram oral tablet. The normalized name is only created if that drug is in scope for Rx norm. So again, if it's a dietary supplement or something out of scope, then they don't give it a normalized name. And if it is unambiguous, so it needs to be very clear. The normalized name always will contain the active ingredient, the strength and the dose form, and it will always be in that order. So out of all of the vocabularies that they go through, about 60% of them end up having normalized names and grouped together in these classes, and about 40% fall into the category where they are either out of scope for Rx norm or they're too ambiguous to be given a normalized name. Once that's done and those synonyms are grouped together and a normalized name has been given, there is an RxCy concept unique identifier that's assigned. So in our particular example, the RxCUI code is 1049630. The fourth step in the process is to start including relationships and attributes from the source data. This might include NDC codes, which we're gonna talk about in a second, marketing information, pill imprint details, ingredient lists, things like that. So anything they're gonna get out of that source data that is going to be relevant for the particular RxCUI that they have identified for that particular concept. And finally, they're gonna create names and relationships for things where they have that additional data in place. So RxNorm is focused on all of the drugs that are within the scope that we mentioned earlier within the US. The full RxNorm dataset is released by the National Library of Medicine on the first Monday of every month. If the first Monday falls on a holiday, then they release it on the Tuesday, but 12 times a year on the first Monday, they do release the full code set. So think of Rx Norm as these are the drugs. And again, its purpose is to support the identification and naming and to support semantic interoperability. So Rx Norm is a defined code set in ONC with respect to the High Tech DAC. So exchanging data is gonna use those Rx Norm codes. So it's important to keep it in mind for that context with health IT. So now let's take a look at NDC. National Drug Codes, which 
you might think should probably be kind of the same thing as Rx norm are related to Rx norm, but in a little bit of a different way. So Rx norm is identifying the drug. NDC is going to identify the product. So it is a universal product identifier for the drug. Each drug is going to have one Rx norm that has, again, the active ingredient, the strength, and the dose form. But each Rx norm can have multiple NDCs attached to it if there's multiple people that are manufacturing it or if there's multiple packages that they manufactured in. So let's look at Benadryl for example. You can go to the store and you can pick up 25 milligram Benadryl tablets and you can probably get a 25 tab count bottle but you can also probably get it in 50 count. You might even be able to get it in 100 count or perhaps a little travel size that has 10. So all of those different things are products and they need to be able to identify each product that's actually being sold or being distributed or being manufactured in the US as well. So it's tied to the Rx norm because Rx norm has the active ingredient, the dose and the dose form, but NDC is the actual product itself. So NDCs are a unique 10 or 11 digit number that are broken down into three different segments. So the three different segments are the labeler or the person who is creating or manufacturing that particular product, the product code, which identifies the strength, the dose form, and the drug formulation that the labeler is producing. And the final segment is the package type, which identifies the size and the types. So again, in the example where we were looking at bottles with different numbers of pills in them, those would have different NDCs. And the number that would change on those ones, if it's the exact same product that's being sold just in different sizes, it's that third segment that's going to change. So NDC is focused on all of the prescription drugs, all of the over-the-counter drugs, and all of the insulin that is in the U.S. It doesn't apply to animal drugs or those that are specifically from your veterinarian or blood products or drugs that are manufactured under contract as part of a kit or part of a combination product. So for everyone that's producing drugs in the U.S., they are required every June and every December to submit a complete list of everything that they're producing to the FDA. The FDA is the one that looks after these lists. The FDA assigns the labeler codes, so they identify who it is that's manufacturing or producing this. And the second and third segments, the labeler actually creates those themselves. So one important thing to know, just because a product has an NDC, that does not necessarily mean that it is a drug as defined by the federal government. And it also does not mean that it is necessarily approved by the FDA. So all it means is that that falls within the scope of issuing NDCs and that that product exists in the US, has a marketing start date, and has not reached a marketing end date. So again, an RX CUI is identified to group together a synonym list of medications by their active ingredient, their strength, and their dose form that is given a common name and assigned a number. So it's a assigned a unique identifier. So that's from the National Library of Medicine. We take that and we can exchange that back and forth and we know exactly what it is. But if we're looking for the product itself, so the product that's being administered that we're gonna keep track of for billing purposes, for sales, for insurance, all that kind of stuff, we're gonna use the NDC codes. So for our particular example, we can see that Johnson & Johnson has seven different products that they market under the brand name of Benadryl that are all 25 milligram oral tablets. And we've got Target who brand name markets Nighttime Sleep Aid, which is also the same drug, same Rx Norm code. And Better Living Brands has four different options that they market as allergy relief tabs. So again, all of those are the exact same Rx Norm code they all have different NDC codes so that we can track what product it actually is that's being sold, that's being administered, that's being charged, billed, tracked, whatever we need to do. But the drug, the dose, and the form is tracked by that Rx norm code. So if you do look at how this structure is set up with the drugs being identified and the products being identified, there is a similar type of structure that exists in other countries. So if you look at drug identification numbers in Canada or Australia, or England, it is very similar to the concept of Rx norm. So they're doing the exact same thing, they just call them drug identification numbers, and then they also have different product identifiers that they break down off of that, that will link back together. So it isn't something that is unique to the US, they just call their sets something unique, and of course the drugs that are available and the drugs that are marketed 
are governed in different countries by different bodies and they're not necessarily the same all over the place. So that's why there's different code sets that exist in different countries. But I hope this gives you an idea of how it's structured, and in particular in the US what ARC's norm codes are and what NDC codes are. From a health IT perspective, these code sets do need to be linked in your database somewhere in order for things to uh, work from an interoperability perspective and from a reporting and billing and tracking perspective. So it's important to sort of understand how they layer together and what it is they're doing because it will give you an idea of what code is being used for what in your particular jurisdiction. So there's also different things that we can maybe go into with a different video, such as Multum and crosswalk tables and all sorts of things that are gonna try to help with some of that functionality and are laying behind it. But I just wanted to start with this one because we did touch on it last week with that international patient summary. And it is one of the areas that I think is going to be fairly challenging for that because these code sets are sort of issued and maintained and tracked within each country's border a little bit differently, of course, because they have different food and drug administrations and different approval bodies. So that's all I have for this week. I will see you again next week with another video. And as always, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and like the videos that you find helpful. Let me know in the comments if there's any other areas that you want me to touch on and I will see you again soon.